Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Toshiden Theatre, Bite-Sized Japanese Urban Legends Volume 1, is now out. If you've ever wanted a collection of short, bite-sized stories you could zip through whenever you have a few minutes spare, then this is the book for you. Bringing you all sorts of Japanese urban legends you may or may not have heard of before, these creepy, odd, and bizarre little tales will keep you entertained and no doubt thinking about them for quite some time to come. Toshiden Theatre is available on Amazon right now, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at some stories of the unknown, of things that lurk on the other side until they finally decide to pay us a visit. For better or worse. First up, a group of friends spend the night on a mountain, but are in for quite the surprise when they're woken up by some voices. But that's not even the scariest part. Find out why in Sound of the Kakara. This is a story I heard from an older friend of mine. I'd already heard a story similar to it before, but sorry if something like this has already appeared here before. This happened when he climbed a mountain one day. The village at the foot of the mountain wasn't too far away, but my friend didn't really like the villagers all that much, so he decided to make camp partway up the mountain, where he could still see the village. There were two rather large flat rocks there, so he started getting dinner ready with his friends. Once they were done eating, they cleaned up and decided it was time for bed so they put a tent up next to the rocks. Next to the tent was a mountain path or trail or something that went up and down the hill. Late that night, he suddenly woke up and realised he could hear the sound of people talking downhill. The voices were getting closer to the tent. Hmm? He thought, but then next he heard the sound of a kakara staff coming from up the mountain. Thinking they might be in danger, he woke up his friends, trembling in fear. Sounds and the light of lanterns were coming from both below and above them. We're done for. Before the thought was even over, someone opened the window in their tent. An elderly man in his sixties or so stuck his face in, and everyone screamed. What on earth are you doing here? The old man said. Huh? He was just a normal person. Everyone walked outside, knees weak, and saw that a procession had stopped. Everyone was in black mourning clothes, with a triangular piece of paper on their heads. What the hell? My friend thought, and at the head of the procession were four people carrying a coffin. It was a coffin meant for burial in the ground. The type you don't see anymore these days. It was a funeral procession. A midnight funeral procession. It was a local custom to bury the dead at night, so as not to become unclean, and then they would hold the funeral the following day. But not only that, the graveyard where they were going to bury the coffin was right behind where they were sleeping. They were sleeping, so to speak, on the border between this world and the next. The coffins were carried by a few people and then buried in the graveyard. The group had no choice but to go down to the village and see the rest of the night out there. But when they asked about the sound of the kakara they heard coming from up the mountain, they got a surprising answer. Ah, that was a greeting from the other side for you. If we had come just a moment later, then… The next day, my friend and his friends visited the shrine of the local deity to apologise and then put the village behind them. He didn't tell me where this village was, but I guess places like that still exist, huh? A few other details I later found out. Apparently, this small village was on a small piece of land in the mountains. And so the space for burials didn't fill up, they had one place for the actual burials, and another place for all the headstones and such. They were kept separate. 
So the villagers told my friend that the graveyard where they buried the coffins would be dug up and the old contents were then placed in small boxes and buried with the new coffin. That flat rock where he ate dinner was just large enough to fit a coffin on, with the lower part representing this world and the upper part representing the next. The families would place the coffin on the upper part to say their final goodbyes, and after that, people other than the chosen relatives would carry the coffin to its final resting place. In a way, the place where my friend stayed was kind of like the Sanzu River. And, in a way, that was even more frightening than a regular graveyard. Next, another group of friends is bored one night and decides to check out the local legend of a cursed Jizo statue. But is the curse actually true and do they fully understand it? Find out in Curse of the Jizo Statue. Curses are nothing to be trifled with. That wasn't something I used to think, but now, well, let me tell you why. When I was still in the first grade at university, I often made myself at home at my friend Y's place. There was usually anywhere from five to eight of us who gathered all night to play mahjong, asleep or awake. Whenever someone fell asleep, someone awake would take their place. And so it would go all day long. Hey, why don't we go check out the cursed Jizo statue? H, who used to hang out with Y a lot, suggested one night. It was 1am, so everyone was in one of those moods, and the five people in the room all turned to look at him like, what? H had a habit of just saying whatever thoughts came into his head, so at the time I was just like, yep, yep, there it is. But then, why seemed to be into the idea? What the hell is that? Sounds fun, he said. And so, everyone else joined in. Everything happened quickly after that. Next thing we knew, we were all in the car and heading towards our destination. H told us on the way all about this cursed statue. There was an old shrine in one of the southern wards of K City. At that shrine, was a narrow path lined with cherry blossom trees, and nearby was a small area with numerous tombstones. Supposedly, there was a small hall behind those tombstones, and inside that hall, you could find the cursed Jizo statue. It was your usual scary story fair, nothing special. But if we were going to see it, now was our only chance, or so H thought, and that was why he invited us all. Here it is! That stupidly large tree is the landmark, H said and stopped the car. He got out and ran over to the shrine like an excited child. Everyone laughed at him, but we followed his trail through the dark shrine grounds like we were getting sucked into that darkness. Relying on the torches we'd prepared in advance, we made our way through the darkness. Being 2am, the ground seemed rather damp and creepy. Not the kind of place you wanted to come to by yourself. But there were five of us, all somewhat noisy and quite grown up. Although, if you look at it another way, what were all these grown ups doing at a shrine at a time like that, huh? Anyway, I didn't feel especially scared either way. Hey! Here it is! Here it is! We turned our lights towards the sound of H's voice and found a flat, inorganic stone face. Ugh! Someone screamed. Illuminated, inorganic stones. There were so many of them in front of us. Tombstones. They were tombstones. And a human arm sticking out like a branch beckoned to us from the rear. It was H. We walked around and there was a small hall right in front of him. The Jizo is in there, I said, shining my light on it. It was a lot smaller than I was expecting. Look at it. 
Can't you feel the atmosphere just seeping off it? H said, shining his light on the area around the door. Oh man, that looks for real, Y said, a suspicious look on his face. I looked at the door at the same time and couldn't help but agree. The door was battered and mouldy, and it was wrapped tightly with thick sacred rope, like something had been sealed inside. I wonder if it's really in there, H said as he started to pull the rope off. Wait, for real? We were all dumbfounded as H tore the sacred rope off and then opened the door. The door was tiny and H's body in the way, so we couldn't see inside. So this is it, huh? This is the cursed Jizo statue. Ah. We all started trembling at H's voice before we could stop ourselves. What the hell? Warn us before you say something like that, Y said, rushing over to H's side, but then... Ugh! H, what the hell is that? He said. He suddenly turned to H and then yanked something out of his hand, quickly putting it back in the little hall and then putting his hands together in prayer. It all happened so quickly that I didn't understand what was going on, but I saw in the light for just a moment what had been in H's hand. It was something round, like a ball. A round stone ball. And that was when it hit me. Could it have been a Jizo statue's head? A chill quickly settled over me. Hey, aren't you guys kind of cold? Someone said. So it wasn't just me then. It was summer, and even though it was the middle of the night, it was clearly not normal for it to get cold so suddenly. Why seemed to sense something as well and he grabbed H's arm and forced him to start walking. H, we're going home. Huh? Why? We just got here. Are you stupid? You're getting too carried away. Why was panicking as well, just as I thought. So that thing H was holding was the Jizo head. In the end, we all got back in the car, despite H's dissatisfaction, and why, clearly upset, drove us home. Sorry, I don't feel like playing Mahjong anymore tonight, Y said. Maybe what H did annoyed him, but after that, he sent us all home. H, also annoyed, left without saying a word. Things felt kind of weird after that, so I stopped dropping by Y's house. I also failed and had to repeat a year, so I just quit university instead, and then returned home to the countryside. Several years later, I had a job in my hometown, I was married with a kid, and I was living my days in happiness. But then one day, I got a letter. It was from A, one of my friends from university, who also used to hang out at Y's house. He wanted to have a reunion, and even though I dropped out before graduation, he wanted me to come. A strange feeling of nostalgia washed over me, and so I decided to call the number written on the letter right away. Hello? It's me. Ah, long time no see. You sound exactly the same. I knew it was you right away. Heh, for real? But yeah, it has been a while, hasn't it? Ever since we went to that shrine with H, huh? As soon as I said that, A fell silent. Hey, what's wrong? Did something happen? I asked. But still, A remained silent. A, what's going on? What happened? Then A's weak voice finally filtered through the phone. Hey, do you believe in curses? Curses? What's this all of a sudden? Are you okay? But then I quickly shut up. Images of H holding the Jizo statue's head at that small shrine suddenly flashed through my mind. 
the curse of the Jizo statue. You quit university right after that, so I guess you don't know, huh? He died right after that. My mind went blank. A curse? The Jizos? There was no way. It was crazy talk. That was the type of stuff you only saw on TV or read about on the internet. You're saying he died because of a curse? No way. It's just a coincidence. Yeah, sure, he undid the sacred rope and took the head of the statue or something, but you're saying that killed H? No way. No way. It's not possible. As I was getting all worked up, A replied calmly. H? No, he wasn't the one who died. Why did? Huh? All thoughts ceased. I shook my head, trying to clear it. Quit messing with me. Why would Y die? He didn't even do anything. This was all backwards. Y was the one who stopped H from carrying out such a blasphemous act. He was the one who put the head back and even prayed to it. So, if curses really did exist, then why did Y die? It might not be the nicest thing to say, but if anyone was going to die from that, then it should have been H. I heard about everything that happened back then from H, A said. Back then, I repeated. Then, as though forcing himself to speak, A told me what he heard from H about that night. According to A, when H opened that small hall, he saw a Jizo statue with its head facing the opposite direction. To be more precise, the head had been removed and then put back on to look the wrong way. Meaning, H didn't take the head off himself, he simply picked up the head that had already been put on backwards for some reason. Y, who saw this, then put the head back and prayed. And then, two weeks later, he tied a towel to a doorknob and died. According to the apartment caretaker, when Y was found, for some reason, his hands were pressed together like he was still in prayer. But why him? I asked. H said something that made me think, A replied. The hall was covered in sacred rope. I think that was because they didn't want anyone to see what was inside. When H took the head, and when Y put it back, he never once saw the face. So what if it was the face in particular that nobody was supposed to look at? In the end, I asked how H was doing these days. Well, last I spoke to him, he said he was going to check for himself. But I haven't heard from him since then. Curious, I went to check the Jizo for myself, but I couldn't even find the hall again, let alone the statue. And that was everything. Where on earth did H disappear to? And what on earth was that Jizo statue? Plus, the most important point of all. Is that statue still waiting somewhere for people to come and worship it, even now? This story from long ago tells of the strange disappearance of some village children, but what really happened? Find out in Kami Kakushi. This is a story of the sea. I was born during the war, and when I was a child, I heard this story from my grandfather. He said that his own grandfather told him this story, so it must have taken place long, long ago. In the old days, there was a custom in one particular village where they kept anything that happened to wash ashore. One day, a large sailing boat washed up on the beach, despite it being a calm, storm-free morning. The sails were lowered and not moving, so the villagers approached it in a small rowing boat and called out, but there was no response. 
The boat appeared to be anchored, however, so there was no worry of it floating away. The villagers climbed onto the boat, but it was empty. They found this strange, because it had washed up early that morning, and the anchor dropped, and yet nobody was on board. The villagers feared that perhaps the boat's occupants had already descended upon their village, but all the smaller boats were still attached to the side. Without giving it too much more thought, they checked the boat to see if there was anything valuable left on board. Both the exterior and interior were undamaged, and there were signs that it was both well used and well maintained. There was also plenty of food, such as rice, wheat, and dried meat. They also found gunpowder, but there were no weapons, such as guns or cannons, on board. Everyone was most pleased and brought what they found back to the village. That night, the village erupted into celebration. But the next morning, that boat had disappeared without a trace. The villagers feared that the boat would travel to another port and that their plundering would be discovered, but no such news ever reached them. Around one month later, every day for five days, a child from the village went missing. They were spirited away. No matter where the villagers looked, they were unable to find them. They suspected kidnapping at first, but no outsiders were ever seen coming or going from the village. In the end, seven children disappeared without a trace. My grandfather added something to the end of the story, though. Was there really nobody on board that boat? Did the villagers really have nothing to do with the disappearance of that boat? Was there some secret actually hiding the real truth? I don't know whether it's related to the story, but shortly after the disappearance of the children, someone from an island near that fishing village saw a man, an outsider not from the island, walking through the forest while he was out farming. The disappearance of the children had been reported to people living on islands in the area, so they were keeping a close eye on any strangers. But no boat could be found that brought the man to the island, and although the island was part of a ria, there was no landing place other than the harbour, and berthing ashore was no easy task. The man in this next story enjoys visiting abandoned roads and buildings in his free time, but naturally, sometimes he comes across things he wishes he didn't see. Find out why in Bang Bang. This is my first time riding here, so please excuse me if it's not so good. I grew up in Kansai, but my wife is from Kyushu, so when we got married, I moved here to live with her, and we've been here ever since. Now, since I'm from Kansai, I don't have any friends here. My wife also works, but on our days off we try to do something, although that doesn't always work out. I've always enjoyed places like abandoned buildings and roads, so I often ask my wife to come along, but she's not really into that sort of stuff. We don't always have the same days off, so when it's just me, I like to get in the car and drive through the mountains. Sometimes I'll even take the narrow roads that are overgrown with weeds. These roads tend to end partway through because they're too overgrown to proceed. But you can't do a U-turn because the road is too narrow, so you have to reverse the whole way out. Sometimes for numerous kilometres. Anyway, sorry for the rambling. The other day, I didn't have work, so I decided to get in the car and go for a drive. I drove deep into the mountains, and after driving for quite some time, I found a place that opened up and looked like a small village. Of course, it was abandoned. I wanted to get out and have a look around, but it was raining on and off, so I gave up. There was a single asphalt road, so I decided to keep driving. Before long, a thick, dense forest suddenly appeared at the end of the road after a gentle curve, and it was like 
a sudden border. And where the forest appeared, the road suddenly turned into a gravel path. To be honest, I was excited. I loved these types of inaccessible roads. That excitement would soon turn to regret, however. I slowly proceeded down the road into the forest, but it gradually got worse and worse. It was even worse than it looked, and I was worried the car might fall apart. But either way, I continued, although slowly. After about 10 kilometers or so, the road was finally overgrown with too much vegetation to pass. It was impossible to go further. Normally, I'd get out of the car and walk around for a bit, but it was still raining and getting heavier, so I decided to simply reverse out instead. When I went to turn around, something felt off. I mean, I could see something or someone to my left. I was looking forward and only saw it for a moment when I turned around, but something was definitely there. It was also cold. Too cold. It was June, and with the rain it was usually damp, but that just made it humid. Now it was cold. Really cold. Maybe I was just seeing things. I was tempted to look again, and calmed myself down by reminding myself that ghosts and monsters and such don't actually exist. But that was a mistake. To the left of the car, there was a single person in the vegetation. Or, rather, there was a single person hanging in the vegetation. It was a corpse. It was a man wearing what looked like white work clothes but they'd turn brown from all the rain and weather. As for his face, well, I don't want to remember it again, but it no longer looked human. As soon as I saw it, I started reversing the car like my life depended on it, caring not for the rocks or trees in my way. I remembered there was a space about five kilometers back where I could do a U-turn, so I kept reversing as fast as I could. I never once thought my drive would end up like this. I was filled with regret, and I didn't look forward once the whole way as I reversed the five kilometers back to the empty space. There was a light banging or knocking outside the car as I hit rocks and trees and such, and although it weighed on my mind a little, once I reached that spot where I could turn around, I was filled with nothing but relief. <sighs> I've come this far. I'm fine now, I thought once I got there. And as I turned around, thinking I could finally return home, I realized something was on the front windscreen. That banging I'd heard. It was bone fingertips. The fear I felt seeing that corpse up close made me throw up. I thought I was going to pass out, but when I looked back up, Nothing was there. It was gone. I drove back home covered in vomit. Looking back on it now, that person no doubt went all the way out into the mountains so they could be alone. Perhaps they thought the vegetation would eventually grow over and claim their body, and nobody would ever see them. But then they regretted it. So when they saw me, they wanted to come back with me. That's just what I think, anyway. The worker in this next story tells of a strange experience from a previous job that, to this date, still hasn't been explained. Find out what in... Button Type Bell. This happened when I worked at an izakaya bar about two years ago. I worked the night shift, but the bar was also open for lunch during the day. One day, I was asked to help because they were short-staffed, and I had the time, so I agreed. At this bar, when a customer wanted to call the staff, there was a button-type bell they had to press. When they did that, 
a number would light up on the electric board to let us know which room it was, and a ping pong could be heard throughout the store. Once that was heard, it was standard for everyone in the store to reply, yes, coming, unless they were already dealing with another customer. The bar opened at 11.30, and we started preparations for that an hour earlier. As we were getting ready for the store to open, I chatted with two other part-timers. Ping pong. Yes, coming. Wait, what? I replied before I could stop myself, and I looked at the other two. Why did the bell ring? The bar wasn't open yet, and there were no customers. Our preparations were done, and we were all in the one spot chatting. A silence filled the air. I'm gonna check it out, I said. I looked at the electronic board. The light for one of the rooms was indeed lit up. I looked in the room, but of course, nobody was there. There was no sign the menu had fallen either. I didn't see anything. I wonder what happened. I tried to play it off, but one of the other part-timers looked tense and asked me a question. Um, was it room 14 by any chance? Huh? How did she know? They couldn't see the board from where they were standing, and I didn't say which room it was either. How did you know? I asked. Sometimes the bell rings when nobody's here. And it always comes from that room. 14. Come to think of it, another of the night shift workers once told me about a woman with long hair who was in one of the supposedly empty rooms. I no longer work there, so I can't confirm one way or the other. I wonder if that bell is still ringing, even now. What could go wrong when renovating a home and then ignoring the family altar. That certainly won't anger the spirits, right? Find out what happens in Inside the Closet. This happened a few years ago, when my parents renovated their house. This really happened to me, so there are a few points I don't really understand, and I wrote it all down in my phone, so... Parts of it may be hard to read. Thanks in advance. Our house was old and run down, so my parents made the decision to fix it up. We were a family of four, although my brother had already married and moved out by that point, and my father alone worked. So most of the time it was just my mother and I at home. Renovations started on the first floor, and I considered renting an apartment to live in while they were taking place. I didn't exactly have a lot of money though, so I decided to stay on the second floor while downstairs was being fixed up, and then when they moved upstairs, I went back down to the first floor. There were two rooms upstairs, the room I already used and the empty room that my mother took. We moved all our stuff either upstairs or into storage, but there was one thing we weren't sure where to put. The family altar. Honestly, I didn't want to spend six months living with the altar in my room. But the altar was too big for the room my mother was staying in, so sadly, we had to put it in mine. Now, it might sound like I'm inviting divine punishment or something, but I really did not want to live looking at that altar every single day. And I didn't use my closet very much, so I decided to hide it in there. Looking back on it now, that was a mistake. At first, I only closed the door when I was in the room, and I still made sure to light incense and stuff while I was there. But after about a month of this, it started to get annoying, so I just left the door closed all the time. I wasn't very good at keeping my room clean either, so it was often a mess of clothes and rubbish. The front of the closet door was often half blocked with stuff too. At some point, I started to forget the altar was even in there, and then something strange happened. That night, 
I suffered from sleep paralysis for the first time ever. I woke up at some point struggling to breathe, and as I wondered what was going on, I looked around my dark room before trying to go back to sleep again. But suddenly I realised I couldn't move. I really could not move at all. My eyes were open and I could look around, but that was it. You hear about this happening to people in horror stories all the time, right? Crap, what should I do? I thought, starting to panic, but then I heard what sounded like a knock coming from the closet door. Huh? I thought, but then suddenly the paralysis broke and I could move again. I remember that even though it wasn't summer, I was sweating all over and it felt gross. But that was the only thing that happened that day. I thought that maybe I was just exhausted from work and went back to sleep immediately. Several days passed and I'd almost forgotten about what happened, when it happened again. I woke up in the middle of the night and a bad feeling washed over me. This time, I could feel someone or something looking at me from the closet. But luckily, I was sleeping with my back to it, so I couldn't tell what was going on. For some reason though, it felt like something strange was looking at me. I broke out in a cold sweat all over, and then I was paralysed again. Again? I thought. I struggled desperately, unable to move, and clearly something was different this time. Something banged on the closet door twice and I could hear the sound of a muffled voice inside. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, but they were muttering something. I definitely wasn't imagining it. A voice was saying something. I struggled desperately again, but still I couldn't move. The more I struggled, the clearer the voice got, and I soon realised what it was trying to say. Open the door. The very next moment, something loudly hit the door. It was followed by a high-pitched mechanical screech that echoed throughout the entire house. What on earth is that sound? My mother screamed. It's going to wake the neighbours. Go check it out. What? I don't want to know what it is. You go look. Honestly, I was scared to death considering what had just happened, but it was true that the noise would bother the neighbours. It sounded almost like an explosion. I had no choice but to suck it up and try to discover what it was. Gripping the wooden sword I got as a souvenir on a school trip once, I slowly went down the stairs, step by step, my knees trembling. About halfway down the stairs, there was a small window that looked into the hall and tea room, so I nervously peeped inside. I relaxed immediately as soon as I realised where the sound was coming from. For some reason, the carpenter's circular saw, I don't know the proper name for it or whatever, had been turned on in the dark and yellow sparks were flying from it. Maybe the carpenter turned it off during the day, but the switch was loose or something, and so it turned on by itself. I ran in and pressed the button, and it stopped moving. The circular thing froze. I was relieved the noise had stopped as well, but then my mother's screams frightened me again. It seemed she was watching me the whole time through that small window. Behind you! Behind you! She screamed. That was the last thing I wanted to hear. I froze, imagining all sorts of things I didn't want to see behind me, and although I didn't want to turn around, I couldn't stop myself. But despite what I was expecting, nothing was there. And yet my mother continued screaming. What? There's nothing there! I screamed back. Behind you! The wall socket! Look! Something didn't feel right, but I turned to look at the wall. And, as expected, the saw wasn't plugged in. 
there was no way it could have been on. Chills immediately ran through me, and I fled upstairs, almost tripping on the way. My mother was nearly in tears. Why? Why was it moving? How should I know? I've no idea, I screamed back. Once we got back to her room, I told her everything that had happened to me up until that point. The sleep paralysis, the banging on the closet door, and the voice I heard telling me to open it. Her expression clouded. We need to open that door and light some incense right away, she said. Honestly, I didn't want to, but something so unreal had just happened, so... I couldn't even bring myself to say, can't we just do it in the morning? Nervously, I returned to my room, cleared all the clothes and rubbish away from the front of the closet, and then put my hand on the handle. I took a deep breath, and then slowly opened the door. It slid open, and when I saw inside, I was once again shocked. There wasn't a face, as I was kind of expecting, but the inside of the closet was a mess. The ashes from the incense sticks were all over the place, and the photo of my mother's father had fallen over and the glass from the frame broke. I immediately cleaned the inside with my mother. We put the photo in another frame we had in the house, and then we lit some incense, put our hands together in prayer, and apologised. No matter how much I ignored the altar in there, I wasn't a believer of the supernatural, so I never believed anything like this could actually happen. I'd like to say the strange things ended after that, but they didn't. I thought that as long as I burnt incense every day, then things would be alright, and I closed the door to sleep every night as well. But just a few days later, I suffered from sleep paralysis again. I went to sleep facing the closet, thinking that everything was finally over, but there, I saw it. A giant, expressionless face peeking through the slightly ajar door. Finally this week, a delivery man heads to a certain building in Tokyo to drop off a parcel, but gets more than he bargained for when he steps out of the elevator. Where exactly is he? Find out in Outside the Elevator. This was perhaps not a scary story, but a strange story that actually happened to me about three years ago. I was a student at the time, working part-time as a delivery man. I went around with another colleague, and this happened during one of our deliveries. I was done delivering a rather large parcel, and next was a small one. It was for a rather large apartment building in Tokyo. Once we got there, I grabbed the small parcel and ran over to the building's elevator. The delivery was for the 12th floor. I pressed the button and the elevator started moving up. But somewhere around the 4th or 5th floor, the elevator suddenly stopped. Even worse, it seemed to be shaking. I quickly realised it had to be an earthquake. The shaking soon stopped but it was the first time I'd ever experienced an earthquake in an elevator. Honestly, I was pretty scared, and I remember holding the parcel with rather sweaty hands. Two or three minutes passed before the elevator started moving again. It continued like nothing had even happened. I later learnt that during an earthquake, the elevator was designed to stop at the nearest floor. At the time, I didn't think much of it, because it was the first time something like that had ever happened to me. Anyway, I heard a ping, and the elevator arrived on the 12th floor. I let out a sigh of relief when the doors opened. But the real problem was what happened after that. The moment I stepped out of the elevator, a huge feeling of discomfort washed over me. Like, something was terribly terribly wrong. And the source of that discomfort was the world itself. So when we arrived at the building, 
it was 3 p.m. When I got out of the elevator and looked outside, the sky was deep red, like the colour of a deep summer sunset. There was also clearly something wrong with the city. Nothing was moving or making a sound, and thick shadows covered the entire landscape before me. Everything was so strange and creepy that I honestly screamed. I had no idea what was going on, and my head was a mess. I immediately ran back to the elevator and pressed the button for the first floor. The elevator proceeded smoothly back to the ground, but I trembled the whole way. The elevator pinged. I looked outside, and it was the fifth floor. The doors opened, and a businessman stepped inside. He jumped in surprise when he saw me cowering on the ground. Are you okay? He asked. I tried desperately to explain what I'd just seen, but I had trouble conveying myself clearly. We soon arrived on the first floor, and I stepped out as though using the man as a shield. The sun was shining just like it had when I stepped into the elevator, and that red sky was nowhere to be seen. What on earth did I see up there? Was it truly another world? I kind of hoped it was nothing more than a lucid daydream or something, but it's kind of hard to believe that could be true. What I saw truly might have been a parallel universe. I don't know much about them, but maybe it was something like that. I wonder what would have happened to me if I stayed there. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina, Giovanni, and Estash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Toshiden Theatre, Bite Size Japanese Urban Legends Volume 1, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at kowabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Kowabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on kowabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kowabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana. True Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.